Okay. So uh, today we are covering sprints 74 and 75. Here are our teams, 15 of them. <clears throat> and um, we have a couple of team updates to share. Uh, here with Ignam, we've got actually a whole new team. Um, I don't know, Holly, do you, are you on? Do you want to say a couple words about the UNAM team shift? Sure. So um, the, old, the previous team uh, had to move on to another project at UNAM. Uh, so we were uh, given another team. Um, the FTEs add up to a little bit like 0.2 less than what we had before. Um, uh, the good news is that um, the leader of the team, Israel, uh, he, he speaks uh, much better English than uh, the people we had before, and he is a tech lead. We were working with uh, more junior developers. Uh, it seems like they have uh, more experience. Uh, Arturo has already worked with Big Test before. So I think uh, I haven't met uh, Elisa Isela. Elis uh, I haven't met her uh, yet. Uh, we just introduced ourselves on on Friday, um, but it sounds like they have you know really good experience, and um, so I'm starting them on some smaller fixes just so they can become familiar with Folio, um, and they seem to be diving right in. So. Uh, if you see one of those names on Slack, uh, you'll know that they're, they're the new people from uh, UNAM in Mexico City. All and right. please help them if you can. <laughs> Great. Thanks for the update, Holly. Yeah, it's, it's uh, sad to see the, the old team go, but yes, I'm glad I to missed hear. Them. Yeah, I'm glad to hear we've got some, some good new folks yeah. helping out here. So welcome um, to the new team. And uh, let's just cruise through the other teams. I saw a couple more updates. Uh, I think it was on Vega. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, Alexander is a new Java developer on Vega. Welcome to the project. Um, and Cheryl Malberg is um, a new product owner um, for Vega and a couple of other teams. She's been, she's from Chicago. She's been a SME on the RA SIG from the very beginning, and she has taken on um, circ rules, loan policies, and calendar. She's taking over for Sean Thomas. So we're super glad to have Cheryl and uh, welcome to yes, the PO team. Everybody. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and oh, and yep, you can see Cheryl is also contributing stories to Concord this quarter. And that was it for new folks. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Jakob. Uh, thank you, Kate. Hello, guys. Um, Hello. I'll start with some Daisy hotfix release updates. Uh, so as, as you know, as we mentioned last sprint review, um, uh, there's been some features or issues, problems, uh, bugs addressed after the Q3.2 deadline, and those uh, has been those have been released as bug fix, as hot fix releases, uh, and there's been a process established for that. So, in Jira, tickets for Daisy Q3.2 hot fixes are labeled as Q3.2 2019 hot fix. You can find them using this link that is provided in the slide. Um, and what that means is that um, um, when a bug or a, um, a, a correction for a feature is deemed a uh, hotfix uh, and label as such, um, there is a backport version release for 3.2. And those backport versions are announced in the releases channel. So it makes sense for anybody who's interested to pay attention to this channel. Uh, maintainers announce those releases there. They also link to the uh, change log, uh, which indicates uh, specific JIRA um, uh, issues that are addressed in, in such uh, such backwards release. Um, so that's the main difference, I think, compared to previous uh, releases where we haven't really done 
much uh, back porting and pop fixing. Uh, we're doing it now, and I'll use this opportunity uh, to really issue a plea to all the maintainers and developers that work on those, well, on any features really, but especially on the on the the ones that are labeled as Q3.2 or going on Q4 uh, 2019 uh, hotfix. Please remember to set the fixed version when the issue is closed. And I was also informed that in some cases, um, the fact that a um, issue will be addressed as a hotfix release uh, may be decided after an issue has been closed already. So in that case, whoever is responsible for preparing that hotfix release, please go and edit that closed issue and set that fixed version field so we have record of, uh, of a hotfix release being made and uh, a particular uh, problem, particular bug address in that hotfix release. It's really important that the fixed version is, is kept um, up to date. All right, so that's it for the hotfix releases. Uh, Kate, could you move over to the next slide? Thank you. And uh, we've seen this uh, during the last spring review already. I'll just repeat, uh, the plan hasn't changed. Uh, we're still um, going for December 4th, um, uh, release uh, mod initial module release deadline. So by that date, all modules will see their initial releases, um, uh, uh, which will form folio Q4. Uh, a release candidate effectively, and that will be rolled out to the Baxas environment and tested uh, over the following week, December 9th to December 13th. Uh, issues will be any bugs, uh, defects will be logged, and they will be you know, triaged uh, using the release back triage uh, channel, and anything labeled for um, uh, as a necessary fix for Q4 uh, will be addressed by the uh, responsible teams and uh, by December 18th we should see hopefully all issues fixed and bug fix releases for those modules where those issues have been discovered prepared and uh, if all goes according to the plan Edelweiss uh, Q4 will become public on December 20th and that's for the otherwise and definition on done for again no changes here I'll just repeat that in, in Q4 uh, we're, <clears throat> we have introduced a new requirement uh, to provide schema migration scripts uh, for any schema changes, um, and those should be uh, should be provided um, according to whatever technology is used for migrations in individual modules. In RMB-based modules, there is a guide on how to do it. Uh, it's linked here. Um, and that's an important migration because we will make an attempt to migrate um, uh, uh, Q3.2 to Q4 on existing data sets. Uh, so we're really counting on all migration scripts to be provided this quarter. Uh, that's my update. I don't think there's time for questions now, but if you do have any questions, please send them over to me. Uh, I'll be happy to respond. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, Jakob. Okay, so per usual, um, each of the uh, team's POs has added the highlights for the sprint. Uh, sorry, not for the sprint, for the two sprints since our last review. So you can look at the slides if you want to see the details of what the teams are working on. Um, but we're not going to go through each of these uh, so that we have plenty of time for our demos. And so that brings us to the demos and we'll be starting out with Thunderjet and Dennis is going to kick it off. Yeah, thank you. I'm not actually necessarily going to share anything, but there are, there were a ton of updates as per usual. It was kind of hard for us to pare things down. Um, so we're going to give you a quick snapshot of uh, some of the, I guess, more involved things that were done um, to the orders module and some other areas. Um, and we're planning to do some some broader demos in in the sort of community meetings uh, later on in the next couple of weeks to showcase some of the other functionality. So with that, uh, I'll pass it on. And I think Alexi is going to start us off. I think Andre is ready to 
show the demo. Andre? Yeah, yeah, hello. Cool. Uh, hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yep. yep. Thank you. I'm going to demonstrate a new setting for order and uh, show what benefit the user will get uh, using it. Uh, so firstly, let's go to setting area, find orders, and here we can see new order setting. It's uh, opening purchase orders. Uh, here we can see only one option. It's uh, allow save and open purchase order when creating or editing a purchase order line. Let's uh, check it and uh, save this setting. So um, let's go to the orders apps to see how it works. Uh, let's create new order from template. Click save. Yes, uh, pay uh, your attention that the workflow status uh, of our order is pending. Uh, let's create new PR line. So we can see that uh, new button appeared. It's save and open order. And if we fill all required fields, uh, we can save our PR line and uh, open order in one click. So we see two green messages that uh, our order was uh, successfully opened and the um, PR line was created. Uh, if we see, uh, look at the uh, workflow start of again, we can see that it was changed from pending to open and uh, our PR line was uh, successfully created. And if we go again to edit screen, we'll see only one button, save and close, because our order is already opened and we can cannot open it again. Um, previously, user have, uh, has only one way to open orders. Uh, uh, he should um, save uh, PO line and then only goes to purchase order level and click uh, button open order. Now he has uh, two ways. So uh, I think it's so useful for users to click once and uh, do more than one action at the same time. I think uh, that's it from my side. So if you have questions, please ask or we can proceed with uh, the second part of our demo. This looks great. I guess we can proceed with the second part. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Uh, hello. So let me share my screen. Uh, this is one. Let me know if you see it. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So today I'd like to present how we indicate uh, items during uh, receiving and checking flow and I uh, items with open request. So before the demo, I created uh, two orders, one for uh, receiving and one for checking. And uh, each order has uh, uh, items uh, and some items uh, have open request. So, uh, yeah, let's go to receiving and uh, receive some items. Uh, so here we have new column called request and uh, in case uh, um, it's not empty, uh, we display yes. Uh, it means uh, there is uh, open uh, request or several. So yeah, let's request several. The same for preview step. And uh, let's receive. After receiving, we display message uh, with uh, item. And uh, yeah, like pieces uh, that uh, have um, requests. Uh, in case there is barcode, we display it. Uh, and uh, in case there is no, we display just item UID. 
uh, and uh, let's go to another order uh, with uh, chicken. And uh, the same, we have column here request that uh, indicates uh, open request. And let's check in the same message uh, with the same information actually. Uh, and uh, that's it with this feature. So let me know if you have any questions. So Makita, I love, love, love this one. Um, for, for any libraries where you're receiving and you've got a mix of notifies that have open requests on them and, and regular books and you want to shunt the notifies to fast cataloging or to skip cataloging. Um, I think this is going to be incredibly helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vikita. That looks great. Um, okay, so we have Spitfire up next with uh, Maxim. Uh, yep. Hi, everyone. Hello. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Yes. Um, great. So um, all of the functionality which I'll be showing today um, is related to requests of type uh, delivery. And uh, the first thing that I want to show you is uh, uh, fulfillment preferences. So, um, request fulfillment preferences is something which a user has, um, and it is used uh, to define uh, how a user wants uh, requests to be fulfilled. So um, currently I'm on a create user page um, and there's a new section called request preferences. Uh, there are two checkboxes which are used to choose uh, which uh, types of request fulfillment will be available to the user. So the whole chef option is always checked. It's, we, we cannot uncheck it. It's always available to the user. And the delivery option can be checked or unchecked. For now, I'll just leave it unchecked. Um, I have to choose the default pickup service point. Let it be cir circulation desk two. Um, oh, I have to fill the fields with some random values. Mm -hmm. okay. um, also email and preferred contact. Yep, so I can save the user with this request preference. I'm clicking save. Uh, we can see the request preferences that we current that we previously saved on the user record. Um, so now I'll go to request application. I want to create a new request. Uh, enter in the item barcode. Uh, and I don't remember what the user barcode is. <laughs> okay, so um, you can see that uh, the fulfillment uh, preferences are pre-filled uh, pre with the fulfillment preferences that we previously saved on the user record. So the circulation desk two is chosen by default and the fulfillment preference select uh, has only hold chef option. Um, that's because when we were saving the user, we didn't check the delivery checkbox. Uh, so now I'm going to check it. Uh, there are two new selects. Uh, the first one, fulfillment preference, is used to choose which one will be chosen by default. So let it be delivery. Now I have to choose some delivery address. But first I have to add at least one 
Mm -hmm. and then add some CT. Um, and another one. Mm. Uh -huh. And that would be home. Okay, yes, now I can save the user. Mm. I'm going to create, try to create the request again. Uh, again. Yep, so as you can see, the request preferences are now here. The fulfillment preference is delivery, as we chose, and the delivery address is home. Um, well, I guess that's it for request preferences. Uh, any questions on this one, on this feature? Looks great, Maxim. Uh, uh, it's nice to see this feature coming yeah. together. Okay, thank you. So also, the team is currently working on some other stuff related to delivery requests. And uh, one thing is that uh, that we're currently implementing the new request status, which is called open awaiting delivery. So the the front end currently the front end already fully supports this status, uh, but the backend is still in the development. So this will be done this sprint. So I can show you. I will search for some requests. I can check the open awaiting delivery status and we see no results. And that's because the backend part is still under the development, but this work will be finished this sprint. So awaiting delivery would be for ones that are getting sent to someone as opposed to awaiting pickup as ones that are sitting on in the library waiting for somebody to come pick them up. Is that right? Um, yep, I guess so. Basically, I yep. mean, actually, they won't stay in the awaiting delivery status for long. The idea is that when you have a delivery request at the top of the queue, when you check the item in, then it is going to change the status to open awaiting delivery, and then it's gonna prompt you to check it out right away to the requester. Oh, okay. And most of the time you'll just do that. But in some cases, if there's like a patron block or some other reason why you can't actually check out to the user, you might have to you know, put it aside for further processing. And, and that's when you'll see it staying in open awaiting delivery. Gotcha. But mostly they'll just be checked out right away. So I guess that's all I have. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Maxim. All right. So next we have Foley Jet with Anne-Marie kicking it off. Yes, thanks, Kate. Um, so I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, we uh, we're lucky to have a little bit of extra UI capacity this uh, this sprint. And so Vlad is going to show some updates we've made to the instance. Um, we all together we did 30 ish um, uh, bugs and little stories for inventory and for acquisitions uh, between Vlad and Masha. Masha is going to show um, the HRID screen setting that we've done in inventory, and then also the um, the expanded log screen that we've done in data import. And then Igor is going to give a quick update on PubSub and where that stands. So Vlad. Mm, hello, uh, wait a second. Uh, do you see the screen? Not yet. Uh, okay, uh, so in the last sprints, uh, we update some uh, items of uh, instance record uh, view Vlad? layout. Vlad, Vlad, yeah. we don't see your screen. There might be a second share button. That you oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, and now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, we update some uh, layout uh, items of uh, instance record. So uh, for the first, we aligned the display of data in the uh, instance record view. Um, now it's uh, clearly divided into four columns. 
uh, here uh, you can see how it looks before our fixes. Um, then uh, we um, changed uh, the list of uh, subjects. Uh, uh, subjects here it is, and uh, the series statements uh, on the uh, multi-column list. Uh, now the list items are alternating in uh, color and more convenient for viewing. Uh, also, we add uh, alphabetical sorting for uh, identifier table and uh, classification table. Uh, we can check it, so add some items to identifier. Uh, uh, for example, and uh, classification. Um, oh, no, uh, maybe. Okay. Um, save. And uh, you can see that uh, all uh, sorted correctly. And the last one uh, in holdings, uh, if we add the item uh, without barcode, um, don't write here any and save uh, we see the uh, corresponding message uh, no barcode uh, before it looks like uh, just a uh, empty string uh, so that's all from my side any questions looks really nice Thanks, Vlad. Thank you for attention. Uh, Masha is up next. Yes, hello. Hello. So let me share my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, so let me start with the inventory settings page. Um, we added HR ID handling to the inventory settings page to be able to adjust the starting number and prefix for inventory HR IDs. So let's click on it. And uh, uh, details pay, pane appears. And here we have three sections uh, which uh, contain required start with field and the sign prefix field and also we added uh, validation on the ui so if a user tries to sorry uh, to enter some invalid data to this field error message appears and uh, now let's imagine that a user made some changes and now wants to navigate away. In this case, a uh, confirmation model appears and if we click on keep editing, then we return to the details pane. But if we click on the close without saving button, uh, it allows us to navigate uh, away, but all our changes will not be saved. And uh, just one note, uh, user will be able to save uh, all changes while uh, once backend storage will be ready. So this is all UI for now. And uh, now I think uh, we should go to data import modules. So um, before the demo, I uploaded a lot of files, uh, but uh, on the landing page, uh, we can see just uh, last uh, uh, 25 files uh, and uh, to view all uploaded files, we should click on the view all button and uh, navigate to the view all lock screen where we have all files uh, sorted uh, by the and it's running by default. So what can we do on this page? We can sort our files 
like this. Uh, then we can uh, search by the ID or by file name. For example, let's find uh, these records and we should input search string, search, yeah. So uh, we got uh, files of the file name of which uh, starts uh, with kernel. But uh, if we want uh, the search to include the source string, we should put an asterisk at the beginning of the source string. For example, mm, let's find this file. And yeah, we got files uh, and the file name of which uh, includes folio string. Then uh, we can filter our files by the error in import, like this, by uh, the date, by job profile, and by user. Job profile has uh, just one option because for now uh, we upload all files with uh, the default create mark beeps job profile. And uh, we have two options uh, in the user dropdown. So let's filter, for example, by Maria. And yeah, we got uh, the files uh, user of which is Maria. So I think that's all about me. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Masha. Uh, Igor is next. Hello, hello. Well, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to share a screen. It's enough. It's enough to have only a slide opened. So, Kate, you want me to open it? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me find it. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, Share and let me just make it bigger. Yes, that's right. So uh, this this presentation, this slide, is a brief uh, overview of the current state of the data import. Uh, just just to take a general understanding of where we are and what things left to do from the backend side uh, to complete with import profiles. So uh, what we are, what we are uh, working on for today, now we are in active implementation, in active development stage of the mechanism to handle uh, data import profiles. These are job, match, action, and mapping profiles. And the result of profile handling depends on profile type and reflects across other various uh, folio modules. And in the nearest time, we plan to touch mod inventory and later this will be uh, mod market. And actually this is about to work with various entities, finding, creating, uh, updating, removing not only with data import entities, but with inventory and market entities. And to implement this stuff, we created two components that share responsibilities between. And these components are module that is, that is called uh, mod pops up and library that is called uh, data import processing core. So what do we have uh, for today for the mod pops up? Uh, for today, all the rest endpoints declared. These are events, publishers, subscribers, uh, audit, and uh, uh, separate publish endpoint to publish events there. Also, we, uh, integ we made integration with Apache Kafka. Integration is done. Kafka is well known as enterprise messaging system. It is similar to messaging queue. 
And we have we have done audit service to track pop sub activities. These are uh, event receiving, event sending, uh, module registration, and uh, implementation to uh, consumer registration and uh, event publisher service are not uh, done for today. They are remained to be done. So a little more and PopSub is ready. Uh, and uh, what do we have for today for the data import processing core library? This, this library is uh, intended to provide uh, infrastructure to receive events, uh, find and call uh, event handlers to handle uh, data import profiles. So the infrastructure to call event handler is done for today and transport layer to send uh, events back to the PubSub is done. Uh, and mechanism for matching entities and mechanism for various entities mapping is uh, now in active development. So for today, both mod PubSub and processing core library are in nascent state and not in real use together. Uh, red items are not ready for production for today. Some of them in active development and some of them are just in planning so far. And uh, to complete development for import profiles, we have to get done all of the items. So that is a strategy to organize data import in the nearest future. Uh, briefly, the cell about data import. Thanks for attention. And Thanks, Igor. We're going to be reaching out to uh, developers that work with inventory and acquisitions and MarkCat as we get further along to be clear on uh, what we need to do in terms of the apps talking to each other and publish and subscribe, all those details and documentation. Yes. That's great. Um, they're probably, I'm sure people have, developers probably have questions about this, but I don't think we have time to nope. talk about it in too much detail. But I do know, you know, we have, like on the core functional, we have a few things that we've said, oh, we could really use PubSub for this. <laughs> like keeping data in sync between um, inventory and requests, for example, like if a barcode is updated in inventory, getting that updated in requests. So I'm glad to see that this is coming along. All right, cool. So let me stop sharing and get back to the demos. And I think we had, who was next? Um, okay, that was fully, okay. So next up is Concord, Dimitro. Hey everyone. Um, I wanted to share some updates um, regarding where we, where we are at uh, with loan anonymization. So uh, there's been a significant progress um, both in backend and frontend parts of it. And I will, I will briefly cover what, I will briefly cover uh, the backend part. So let me share my screen now. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so let me first show how to get to the settings. You, you go to <coughs> settings, circulation, and loan history. Uh, here you will see um, settings for automatic loan anonymization. Uh, so as you can see, um, and there are three the uh, three settings for um, anonymizing closed loans, and also we support um, exceptions for loans with fees and fines. So they can have their separate settings. Uh, so th this was um, a brief introduction on the backend part. And now I pass the floor to Sergey, who will tell you about the front end part of it. Uh, and by the way, should you have any questions, feel free to ask now or just write to me. I will gladly answer. Thank you. Okay, guys.
Dimitri, uh, can can you give me the right to share? I my probably screen? can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. <laughs> and uh, okay, can you can you see my screen, guys? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, for the demo, I'm going. I'm going to use the Folio Snapshot environment. On the settings circulations page in the loan history section, you can see the form. This form consists of the default section for creating settings for anonymizing closed loans. There is also section for uh, treating loans with associated fees fines and the section for adding exceptions. Uh, uh, it's currently not completed yet and is under development. <clears throat> One of the functionalities that our team worked on is a validation of data sent, sent to the backend. And now I'm gonna show you how it works. The first validation case uh, is to make user uh, to create settings for anonymizing closed loans. It means even if the user has filled in the input field, for example, like that, but hasn't selected any radio button, it's not gonna give him the possibility to save this data. When I click the save button, as you can see, the error message appears below the radio button group. <clears throat> And after selecting any of this radio button, the error message disappears. Another case of validation is uh, to prevent the sending invalid data that entered into interval selection section here. When user try, tries to put the incorrect value in the, for example, first input field, uh, for our case, it's uh, for our case it's a negative date, negative value, negative number, or zero, or number greater than one hundred, or when user try to leave this field empty, the appropriate error message appears below. Similar situation happens with the second field. Uh, user has to select some value from the drop down menu in order to avoid the error message. Uh, this approach apl applies to all radio button groups in all sections. Uh, that's all about data validation and now I'm gonna go ahead to another functionality. For that, first I'm going to inventory. And here I'm, go I'm gonna copy this barcode. And let's go to the check-in application. Uh, I'm gonna show you uh, how to uh, display the scan time for items that checked in, uh, even if these items were not checked out. Before the implementation of this functionality, uh, it, works, it worked only when the scan was closing the loan. Uh, and uh, now I enter this barcode here and after saving as you, as you can see uh, the turn return time return field is populated with the current time if the user wants to set a different time let's say for simplicity 101 
and save. Oh no. After saving, uh, the setup setup time will be displayed here in this field. Uh, as a result, this feature allows staff users to track the check-in process and have full feedback on what they scan. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sergi. Looks good. Uh, looks like we've got one more demo from Concord and it's Victor. Yeah, cool. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, could you uh, qualify whether you can see it? We can. Okay, uh, I just yeah, wanted to add uh, about the anonymization a bit that uh, for now we already like have some work done, uh, we can work done on anonymization. And as you can see, we have now three options where we can anonymize immediately uh, upon some interval and never. So we are gonna show these uh, options on the next demo uh, for sure. And now I just want to show a couple of days uh, updates on circulation rules editor. And uh, for first of them is uh, Filter highlights highlighting feature for uh, location type. So let's uh, uh, choose some library. Yeah, and now we can see that there are a couple of locations, and we can actually filter through them. And previously, uh, we just filtered, but don't uh, see what we uh, have some highlighting stuff, which we have here. So as you can see now, as I typed in, uh, we already have it here. So and uh, also, I just want to emphasize that uh, the search is case insensitive. So now I type CC, but in a lower case, and we can see that we have matched, uh, matched uh, appearances. So that's all about it. And another feature here is uh, the new fine policy. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we work on top of uh, already created uh, uh, feature for overdefined policies where we can specify in here and uh, now they are available in the circulation rules editor and for that we should use uh, all letter and uh, so from now, from now on this policy is required so if I want to save uh, circulation rules editor without without that uh, letter I would have errors that the same will come for the case when I uh, select multiple uh, multiple policies and also when I just specified a letter but I have not provided uh, some value and we can see the uh, standard drop down for selecting so for selecting uh, policies and now I can save so uh, this is only just like available in the uh, editor but uh, uh, like uh, whatever we specified in our defined policy uh, is not yet like applied to the actual policy and there's further work uh, and it uh, should be done. And uh, it's all about the question rules editor and now I'm gonna move to permissions. Uh, I have probably have uh, developed several permissions for uh, once. And for that, I created a test user. Uh, and then, as you can see right now, that user doesn't have any permission. And let's assign in uh, this user some uh, newly created permission. And uh, we, I'm gonna start off with users, uh, user wants view, which basically provides access for viewing information about wants. And for that, uh, let me switch to encoding tab. And I'm gonna log in under this uh, this user and navigate uh, to a particular user. And uh, basically, these permissions allows us to see standard information, which is basically available under uh, basic permission for users app, where which can where we can just see uh, navigate to the user's application. And this permission basically provides us access to one's uh, accordion and uh, all the uh, like data for for once uh, and 
that includes uh, history for open wounds and closed wounds, and uh, also uh, his, like uh, particular wounds details section. And uh, also as a part of this work, um, uh, basically when we have all permissions, and for example, when we work in as user ad deco admin and have all permissions, uh, usually the, here we have a link to a Fifine section and under this permission, since we don't have uh, any Fifine uh, permission, we don't have a link and just have a read-only value. And that's all uh, the difference. Uh, let me show some new, uh, some other new permissions and uh, they also searchable through one. And this is uh, user uh, user one edit permission and user uh, one's renew permissions. Let me save that and log out and log in in order to uh, have these permissions applied. Again, uh, let's navigate to the same user. Open it, this user details and uh, here we have uh, changes that uh, these two permissions uh, basically allow us to see those two buttons, not just two buttons, but two features because we have actually those um, features available in different places, for example, uh, here and here. And when we open details for a one, we also can see uh, these buttons uh, there. And uh, let's just uh, confirm that they really work. And for that, for example, I can uh, select one of the uh, one and renew it. And uh, as you can see, that once uh, is successfully renewed. And let me also sh change the DJ for that one. And let's specify this date. And we can see that it works. Also, um, as a part of uh, uh, change due date permission, this button is also available in UI checkout uh, application. And uh, if uh, the user has permission for changing due date specified, uh, they all, this users also have access for this uh, button in uh, UI checkout application. Without that provision, uh, it's impossible uh, to have this button in UI checkout application when we have a list of our checkouted ones. And that's all for me. Thank you, guys. If you have any questions, please uh, raise us. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, it seems like you guys made a lot of progress. Um, Let's see. So next we've got Vega with Kostya. Hello. So let me share my screen. Please let me know when you see it. Yeah, we see it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, feature I would like to talk about uh, with you today is connected with the uh, pattern notices on checkout. So, how this feature works uh, right now, the current status of this feature on environments like Backfest. Um, on every checkout, uh, Pattern receives a notification message, notification email with a, a single item in it. Uh, so, for example, 20 checkouts or 30, 20 or 30 emails, which is not always convenient. And uh, it was decided to modify this feature to have uh, a single notification message, message with a multiple items in it. So first, to make it work, what needs to be done is we need to slightly modify <coughs> the template in settings, uh, circulation, uh, pattern notice templates. I have one already created and uh, this section should be presented. So we need to include loans. 
uh, which will work with multiple items. And uh, uh, item information in it, item title I've included and call number. Okay. Um, let's proceed with checkouts. I've created a user with my mail and uh, a couple of check, uh -huh. enter. And a couple of checkouts. So, uh, no notification for now. Uh, there are currently there are two possible ways how to finalize how to end this uh, so-called pattern notice session. First is uh, we need to hit end session button here. And. And I've got an email with the items I've already checked out. This is new one. So I need to check in all these items. And the second way to finalize uh, pattern notice session. Again, check in. First, second, and the third one. So the second way is to just scan the another pattern. I will find the negative one. Done. And yes. Yes, this one second. I received a second email. Basically, that is it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Cool, Kostya, that's really cool to see. I know that was a lot of design and development. I have a question, um, What if you just close your browser tab, does that trigger an email as well? Well, it is planned and it's uh, under implementation. Uh, uh, triggers like uh, session timeout, uh, browser closure and uh, logout. Cool, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have Stripes Force with Rasmus next. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Just give me one second. Share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So uh, yeah, I just want to do a quick demo of a new component that we added this uh, in the latest sprint. And um, uh, the common component's name is called Message Banner. And uh, basically, it's a component that you can use to uh, render a useful message for the user uh, in the case of an error, a success, a warning, or just some plain message that you want to uh, communicate to the user. Um, the component itself comes with uh, a show and hide functionality with a little transition and it comes with a bunch of uh, useful props for doing all sorts of different things. And if you're going to use the component, I would recommend that you take a look at the readme because there are some small gotchas regarding accessibility. Uh, and here is some examples of the component with a dismiss button, which is optional. So you can click to hide. And yeah, I guess that's that's it for me. 
Nice. I like that. Um, I guess, uh, John Coburn, you're also going to show something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, actually wanted to talk about uh, some of the work that uh, we've done the past couple of sprints and the uh, UI users uh, routing refactor that uh, uh, has sort of maybe gained some infamy or, uh, but it was a lot of work on UI users. Um, I can go ahead and share my screen. I've got a couple of slides I want to go through about it. Uh, let's see, share. All right, hopefully. All right, can you guys see my UIU routing refactor slide? Yeah. Great, yes. cool. Uh, so uh, it was a big refactor. We wanted it to kind of be a, sort of a seamless refactor, clean up UI users. Um, and, uh, you know, UI users, It's if it's not our oldest UI module, it's it's probably in those top three or four. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of teams have worked on it over time. Um, you know, there's been a lot of different hands, a lot of different code code styles, uh, you know, all through it. Um, and, you know, we had some new ideas as far as to how we wanted uh, uh, routing and things to uh, routing patterns and stuff within Folio modules. So we wanted to go ahead and implement thing, those things and uh, uh, go through and, and clean up. And so here I am today kind of showing some of the benefits and stuff that this is that this has given us here uh, in, in UI users. So uh, as I mentioned, it was kind of a, you know, a, it was a, a silent refactor. It didn't change too dramatically things in the UI. Like there wasn't any particular features, but it was more of a, of a behavioral kind of change. So, you know, as you're going through the UI, you'll see things like loading indicators in UI users. We've, we've seen it in several demos today already. Uh, Victor demoed some stuff from there as well as others and transitions between requests and users as well. So you'll see a lot of loading indicators in the UI. Uh, you'll see some immediate feedback and user edits. So there used to be this sort of pause after you hit the save button or you hit a, uh, you know, you hit the save shortcut key. Uh, so, so quite fast. And uh, it's direct to page uh, now uh, versus the behavior that we kind of saw previously, like before there was sort of a, a three pane layout, the search detail pane would show for a brief bit, uh, but now it, it goes directly to it. Um, and I could just, you know, quick quick demo of that. Of course, you got the loading indicators you see there on the detail view uh, that come up. You know, those were added added in as a result of this the routing refactor. Um, you know, some quick feedback on the on the edit screen. Let me just stick an S on the end of Miss Block's name. Save an indicator and here pop back. So, you know, very snappy interaction, um, uh, good user feedback, good, I guess, immediate. Uh, if you, uh, it, you know, it's there and it's, and it's, and it's kind of subtle now, um, uh, subtle change from, from the way it was before and we won't miss the old ways. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about the direct linking aspect now. So it's like, if you click a link, into users. I'm in checkout right now. I'm going to set up a, <laughs> a quick checkout um, of an item. Pardon my, this is my sort of cooking show uh, where I've gotten all this data on a, on a little clipboard. Uh, so if I click through directly to the loan details, which goes directly into users, it'll take me directly to that loan's details. So no longer does it does it have the um, you know the three pane layout for a brief moment, and eventually spinning up all of its all the application state to get you there. You're you're directly there now. So uh, some good good nice nice updates uh, that we've got as far as the behavior of the application. Uh, so just continuing to go forward, just the maintainability of the code. Um, so it's a more organized file structure uh, within users whenever developers have to perform changes 
uh, add features and things within the UI. Um, things have sort of been separated here into a data layer, uh, the, the routing and the presentation uh, aspect. Um, and the, and the, uh, the naming of the files, it's a lot more workflow oriented. Um, so uh, just again, you know, a quick visual, I'll actually go back in time here and show what we had before. <clears throat> So this was the source folder on the UI users module before. You can see there's a lot of files. There's a lot of stuff going on here at the top level. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of folders here. And then and there's there's more files even deeper, you know, into this. Um, transfer fast forward to today. Um, here we actually have, uh, this is our top level folder. So, <laughs> Uh, it's it's a lot cleaner. There's a lot less uh, things living in the top level uh, of users, and uh, you know uh, things are clearly named as far as the data the data container goes. Uh, accounts, charges, loans, users the main things users manages. Um, and then switching over to the views, accounts, loans, and users. So there's sort of a uh, a better organization, better better naming of things, and it results in a much more maintainable experience when we're adding features uh, to this. Uh, let's see, so workflow oriented and test coverage. So uh, after the routing refactor got merged in, and we we had a couple of bugs that came up, and we fixed those, and then attesting to those. Uh, test coverage went up 10% on UI users, 63.7 uh, to 73.5, and I took a little screenshot there of the nice little spike uh, in the uh, Sonar Cloud for us. Uh, it's less client end code in the application itself. So the view user file itself went from over a thousand lines of code, uh, 1,136, down to 573, so it cut that in half. Really significant work and additional test coverage and edit users, loans, and the fees, fines, workflows. I'm sorry if I'm going a little bit fast. I'm kind of trying to save time and I know this might be a little lot. <laughs> um, accessibility, so smaller page markup is better. Uh, in, in, in all these cases, the less of a DOM, the less elements there are on a page, less likely for users of assistive technology to get lost uh, in the DOM. And so I went and I took some screen captures and used a special tool that would let me capture uh, scrolling of the, of the DOM. So this, this white bar is what it might look like to a lot of, a lot of folks, but there is actually text inside of this, very tiny. Um, this is all DOM elements. This is an actual capture of the DOM as it was in the old UI users when you viewed the open loans listing page. Uh, a lot of elements, a lot of stuff, very easy for assistive technology to probably get lost in all this. Uh, after the routing refactor, this. <laughs> is the markup. So a uh, much smaller DOM footprint. Uh, uh, so much better in, in such a better place now than it was a couple of months ago. Uh, future work. Routing and navigation primitives. We really need some of this stuff in, within Folio as a framework for building these uh, productivity Folio apps good ways to sort of navigate around the system, good ways for developers to make those things. It was some of the, you know, the bigger struggles that I ran up against when I was doing the work in this refactor. Um, these sort of routing and navigation primitives would make a lot of that a lot easier. Um, uh, the breadcrumb work, this has been, you know, a uh, design that's been talked around since the beginnings of Folio. And I think some of the work that came that would result from the things we did with this routing refactor uh, could could allow us to build things that would enable us to build breadcrumbs. So good navigation uh, that would, would work, you know, cro across uh, applications, good conventions uh, features there. And then cross application <coughs> links. 
ways for one application to obtain uh, URLs, you know, to other applications so that cross-linking uh, and cross-app interaction uh, becomes a much cleaner and much easier to set up process. Um, uh, big thanks to a lot of the people that helped over the course of it. It took a lot of time uh, to do this refactor. It was kind of juggled between other, you know, big components. Uh, uh, Zach Burke helped tremendously. Uh, the Stripe architecture guys, uh, a lot of the folks who are regulars on those calls, Mark Deutsch, uh, uh, Victor, helped, you know, helped tremendously um, uh, tracking down bugs afterwards. <laughs> Um, uh, a lot of people have, have played a lot of important roles and I just kind of did the grunt work and moved files around and broke things along in the process. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is leaving on me. Uh, but that's it. That's all I got. John, could I ask two really quick questions? Yeah, sure. Um, the three big dots when you're waiting for data to come back, um, we have little mm -hmm. tiny, tiny light gray dots in most every other place. Is that a new style that we're going to be trying to use across Folio? Uh, so th that is a, that's a component that I ended up adding within UI users right now. And I do want to mark that up to a shared uh, component so everybody can have access to that. Um, but yeah, not it's right now. It's, definitely uh, it's just in the easier. <laughs> definitely easier to see than the really little ones. Um, yeah. And with the users, are, are we ever going to get to a point where we can assign permissions as we're creating a user, or we're always going to need to create the user first and then go back and assign the permissions? You know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure there. I think one of the permissions things is kind of a post save kind of process that, that sort of happens, but I'm not, speci I'm not specifically sure uh, what the status yeah, of the feature that like that would a, be. That was a back end constraint, Anne-Marie. Okay. Um, we did, you know, kind of, we wanted to obviously have it all be in a one step process, but it was just, uh, it was going to cost a lot in terms of development. So in the interest of thin thread, it's uh, two steps for now, but yeah, we could definitely come back later and, and make some changes to have it be one step. Good to know. Thank you. Thanks, John, for the update. It's great to know um, all the benefits of that refactor. And I know some of those have been really long standing issues. So that's awesome. And we've got one more demo and um, it, and then Anton's update. So um, core functional with Matt Connolly and then Michal. Hi everyone, um, getting my screen up here. So today I'm going to show just three uh, pieces of work the team did uh, improvements in inventory. And um, you may have already noticed some of these during the earlier uh, excursions into the app during the previous demos, but I'll press on nonetheless. So I'm gonna start here in um, good old Daisy. Uh, this is what the um, previous search and filter uh, panel looked like. And um, we have, uh, it's, it's monolithic at this point. So instead of having separated um, filters and searches for different types of records and inventory, uh, instances, holdings, and items, we just have this one panel here. So in the newer versions, um, this uh, uh, um, tab, has been added here so that we can switch between the three types of records we have. And each, um, each pane has its own sets of filters and search options, or they will at least. Uh, obviously holdings and item have not been filled out yet, but um, there's uh, a lot more coming in terms of the number of filters here and the, the search options. Um, and one thing to note is that if I do uh, search here and add a filter or two um, uh, in instance, uh, those options come up and then if I switch into one of the other tabs, everything is cleared out so we can start afresh and then coming back here, same thing. Um, so that's the first item. Now let me uh, pull up a journal here uh, so we can look at the record. Um, and again, um, you may have seen this already, but uh, we're starting to 
um, uh, rearrange parts of the uh, view of the record here uh, to make it more user friendly. And so the first thing we've done is uh, taken the holdings and item listings, which previously were way down at the bottom of the record, and um, now they're right at the top, so they're easy to find and uh, access. All right, and then um, the last thing is uh, something I'm going to start with uh, from here as well. So we've added fields now for preceding and succeeding titles. Um, so these are for things like journals that may have changed their names over time to avoid detection. This lets us uh, track them down. So in this case, we've got the um, ABA journal record, and it uh, has a succeeding title link in place. So I can click on that, and that takes me to the record for the American Bar Association Journal, which is uh, succession, a succeeding title to ABA. And in this record now, you see we've got a preceding title and also a succeeding title. Um, preceding, of course, just takes us back to ABA again. Uh, succeeding, this is something completely unrelated that I just put in as a demo here, that I can click through on that and I get to transparent water for whatever reason. Um, one thing that makes these uh, preceding, uh, succeeding title fields a little bit different from some of the others in the record is that uh, they're implemented uh, in the back end as an instance of, um, of uh, parent and child instances, which was already implemented down here at the bottom under instance relationships. Um, so that includes things like analyst or bound with and um, monograph series. So what I can do here is um, I'll start with another record here. And if I go into edit, um, down under title data, uh, I can add a preceding or a succeeding title. I'm going to add one of those in. Um, this is all based on UUIDs for now. Uh, we'll have um, more user-friendly controls in a later version of things. And then I'll scroll down to the bottom, and I'm also going to add here, oops, I'm going to add a parent instance. And notice um, there are three types of relationships I can choose here. There's actually the fourth type, which is preceding, succeeding, but that's hidden from this uh, selection list because it doesn't make sense to, to show that here uh, because preceding and succeeding is up at the top. So I'll choose bound with in this case, and I'll save and close that. And you can see that we have our preceding title up here and our bound with uh, instance down here. Um, and again, on the back end, these are basically the same thing, just with a different relationship ID, but they're properly separated in the record. And that's all I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. All right. And now we're on to Michal. Michal. Thanks, Kate. Let me just share my screen here. Sorry. Um, thank you, Matt, for showing some of this uh, work. Um, I will be very quick. I just have two, two different features. Um, both of them will be in uh, your request, uh, your requests module. So the first one is um, related to this new um, functionality, functionality we added re related to reordering existing uh, request queue. So you can see that I'm on the uh, specific request here, and there's this new um, option here under request details called reorder queue. And if I open that, um, I will see this new page where uh, on the top, I will see some information about the specific item. And then at the bottom, all the open, currently open requests um, for this particular item here. Um, and in order to reorder this queue, I can just simply drag and drop an item up. Oops. That's, that's actually new. I haven't seen this one before. Um, and down, I'm not sure if maybe I lost um, session here. Let me just refresh this. Yeah, I'm not sure what this is about. Um, but anyway, um, the idea is- Mial, sorry. Um, the, the one that's awaiting pickup. 
that should probably move that up to position one, and I imagine that 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 error might go away. Uh, you mean this one here? Um, yeah, I haven't seen this <laughs> error before, so I'm not sure what's happening here. But um, yes, the the idea here is that um, we should be able to just drag and drop this uh, easily, and uh, the position in the queue will change. We we do handle a couple uh, specific cases. Uh, I think that one of them you just saw that when we try to um, move the item up above the page uh, request, uh, we'll be presented with this additional model which will uh, tell us that it's impossible to um, move the item above the page request and um, the item will be just dropped into the second position in the queue. Um, so that's that's it for me. I'm sorry for this error. You know, I'm not sure what this is, what, what is happening here, but like even 20 minutes ago, I didn't see it. So I'm not sure if something has changed on the back end or not. I wonder, sure. wonder if top of the hour did something, but Kate and I both tested the heck out of this and it was beautiful yes, and no I, error uh, messages. <laughs> I, I can tell you what it is, I think. Um, okay. So if you look at the, the queue, there's an open not yet filled request at the top of the queue, um, but it's, it's a paid request and it's a delivery request. So, um, and I suspect that data was created by a previous demo. So, oh, I see. Maybe um, that, that's true, Mark. I only had three requests before. So, and so, well, I'm glad, and so, I'm glad and so we we've, got, we've got a weird. Yeah. So now we've got a weird situation because you can't fulfill a delivery request yet, so you can't move it. So you can't. So you can't. So the so the normally the top of the request at the top of the queue would be the one that's being fulfilled. But in this case, we've got a paid request for delivery requests that can't be fulfilled, so it can't be shifted. But it also means that the next fulfillable request isn't at the top, which is going to confuse things. Uh, okay. Th thanks for explaining this, Mark. Um, so the second one is uh, quick. Um, it's something which Ryan was working on, and it's related to uh, preventing requests from bring, being created by inactive users. So let me just... Uh, try to choose an active user here and I'll just select the service point. And when I hit new request, I can see this new um, error message called uh, saying that inactive users cannot be make requests. Uh, so this wasn't here before and I'm glad that we have that in place now. And that, uh, that will be it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Michal. Maybe you can come back and demo the other page next time. It's just, it's really fun to use and the drag and drop is exciting. I'm sure we'll find lots of other places to use drag and drop. Um, but okay, all right, cool. So that's all of our demos and we do have a little bit of time now for Anton to do an update and I think he didn't need much time anyway, so that should be fine. Are you ready, Anton? Yes, I'm trying to share and it's not responding. Do you want me to share the slides? Uh, if you could, Kate. Sure. <clears throat> Let's see. And okay. you present. Is this your first slide? I don't see it yet. Oh, no? Nope. Maybe. Does anybody see it? Because it looks like I'm sharing. I, I can see, see it. Now. it. Yes, slide 36. And maybe yeah. you're yeah. frozen. This is it. OK, hi, everyone. I'll be very brief today. Uh, as usual, QA dashboard has been updated with the Sprint uh, 75. The link is on the slide if, you, if you're interested to go and take a look. Uh, so the table shows the coverage for the core, uh, core modules. We're making, we're making uh, great, uh, good progress. I really appreciated uh, John Coburn's presentation on the cleanup of the UI users because this is one of the modules that carries lots of defects and just clean up and increasing code coverage is great. Overall, we're inching towards the passing grade, but you know, there's some modules that don't have um, 
don't have cover uh, don't have coverage at all so anytime um, you have uh, to spend on working on the coverage would be greatly appreciated because it will reduce number of bugs that we have so in my second slide Kate if you could fast forward one slide uh, that one is 180 days so uh, it just shows that starting August we started accumulating accumulating bugs, and it's because a lot more people have hands on the application. It's because Chalmers is uh, contributed 130 defects uh, by itself. Not of them, not all of them got transferred into the community uh, projects, but still they contributing a lot of uh, defects and requests. So. Again, any time you have to address the bugs, uh, please, uh, please do that because we want to keep this, uh, this uh, we don't want to open this gap too wide. So right now it's about uh, uh, give and take 100, 100 bugs, uh, but uh, we, need to do, we need to do better than that. It should be instead of pink, it should be green trend and we are in reverse we are closing less than we're opening so anytime any bug you can fix contributes to the shrinkage of this and uh, the other little thing uh, we are working on the improving test cases for the bug test so that we used totally different group of people during the last bug fest. It was not product owners or implementation consultants. It was mostly volunteers from different libraries. And the feedback was that uh, we need better description in the test cases when we only have summaries. So during this quarter, we're working on uh, building better descriptions for the test cases so then the knowledge, um, the level of uh, folio knowledge is not going to be required and we can pretty much throw anybody at the uh, execution of test cases. So hopefully we'll have about 75% uh, of all the test cases covered with descriptions so that anybody, uh, anyone with low or almost no knowledge of folio can work on them. And this is all I have for the moment. Are there any questions? I guess not. I guess um, not. Then you'll all, the road is free to lunch and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and it's perfect timing because we're at half past the hour and um, yeah, the rest of the slides just summarize our plans for the upcoming sprint, sprints, um, and we will see you in four weeks, which will be right around the end of the development period for this quarter. So we've got two more sprints um, before the module release deadline. So good luck, everyone, and I'll see you next time.